Thank you to CSSA for inviting me. I was at the first founding meeting of CSSA several years ago in Cambridge. And I remember sitting there looking around the room wondering what this organization was for and what it was about. Little did I realize how many thousands of Chinese students, undergraduates, postgraduates, doctorate <laughs> students, teachers, would come to the UK and participate in CSSA. I have a very special place in my heart for CSSA because of the work that it does amongst the Chinese student uh, and uh, postgraduate population. I don't think, I, I mean, first of all, I'm not an economist, I'm not a politician, um, I'm not a policy maker, so uh, I'm a businessman but by, by background. I kind of read, try to read quite a bit and I try to get a sense of the answers to those questions because you can have all the theories in the world, you can study all the people in the world you want to study, but you come back to those basic questions. And that question is, how do you manage the forces, the economic forces, and encourage development and growth, but prevent abuse? And um, I think it is by a great deal of study and anticipation of what is going to happen. So you take the, take the example of, um, of shadow banking. I mean, I don't know how many people here are into shadow banking, have read about shadow banking. I don't know, so I, I, okay. Shadow banking is, you know, you've got the major banks in China, and then you've got a, 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 another area about the same size where the private sector, all the people who made money, the SOEs, all the different people who've accumulated money, they buy products in, uh, in other types of um, financial institutions which are then lent to people who, who need money. And the interest rate that they carry is much higher than the interest rate from the bank, but the people who are borrowing from, from that source of money can't get their money from the bank, so they, they, they get their money from these other, this other type of what's called shadow banking. And people are very concerned that the shadow banking of China is about to collapse. Actually, the shadow banking of China is regulated. It's not regulated very tightly, and it's going to be regulated very tightly. But if you look at the numbers, the total volume of this, what we call private sector banking in China, is probably, uh, together with the regular banking sector, the total of it all is about the right level of, uh, of, of borrowing and lending for a, an economy the size of China. But you've got these two very different types of, uh, of structures. One which is formal, which is the state, lending mainly to state-owned enterprises, and the second, which is mainly private sector, lending to the private sector. Well, I think that a great deal of anticipation went into what was going to be created here and that the problems and solutions have been anticipated a long time in advance by the planners. But they've allowed the problem to, be, to mature and come into focus so that people agree with them about the solutions. So I think what you'll see in China is the problems of development will be allowed to happen but the preparation for the solutions will already be there. Uh, I mean, they do get it wrong. Things, things uh, get out of hand. I remember, you know, for example, in uh, polyester as an alternative to cotton, uh, they trebled the production. They all came on stream in one year. It was all going to come on stream in one year, and suddenly they cancelled contracts with Germany to slow down the building of new plants. The Germans went mad. This is the early 80s. And in the end, the, 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 the rescheduling was done. So th they do get things wrong. But in general... If you look at the chaos in the West from the financial crisis and compare it to the problems that occur in China from unexpected events, the problems in China are much smaller than the problems in the West. That's my view, anyway. Mm -hmm. It's like you are an expert of Chinese culture or China or Chinese people. So I just wonder, like, if you can just name one character to summarize, like in your opinion, all the Chinese culture or Chinese people, what do you think is the most significant character? Characteristic. Yeah. Or are you not asking me to name a Chinese... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is the most significant character, a characteristic of the Chinese people? Yes. I think uh, their, uh, their modesty. Modesty. Uh, which is a weakness and a strength. You know, um, uh, people, it, it, 
from time to time, for example, I've been to an airport to meet a Chinese, um, somebody important from China, and they say he's in there, in that room there, around that table, and there will be 16 people around the table. I can't tell who the leader is. <laughs> if it was a, if it was a, if it was, if it was a British group, I'd be able to understand it very quickly. Generally speaking, most Chinese that I have dealt with are fairly modest in how they present themselves and how they and how they present their power and their um, uh, and their personalities. I think um, a lot of foreigners think China uh, is uh, weaker and less um, clear about what it wants to do. So very often you go into a, situ into a meeting, I would imagine it often happens that David Cameron will go into a meeting and people will ask him a lot of questions and it will sound to him like they don't really understand very much and they're asking very basic questions. What he doesn't understand is they're being polite and they're, they're, they're giving him face and they're giving him the opportunity to tell them things. It doesn't mean that they don't understand and they don't have their own view. But it's very easy. Most foreign business leaders develop a misunderstanding of China because they can't have a discussion on an equal basis with the Chinese. They can't have that um, kind of, um, uh, not aggressive, but they can't have that kind of uh, testing exchange that they would normally have with each other because it's just not the way the Chinese um, talk and negotiate. Chinese are much more circumspect, much more uh, careful about what they say and how they say it. And you know, from your point of view, you know if you're going to be in business in the West, you've got to be a bit more like the Westerners, so you'll adjust yourself. But it won't be deep down. It'll be for the purpose of communication. Thank you. Can I have a question on football? <laughs> 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 there was a question there. there. Um, okay. Okay. You could ask a football question. No, no. no. <laughs> I kind of want to turn back to the, to the business because I, I yeah. want to talk about culture and yeah. stuff. For the training of a uh, business training in the uh, UK and China, I'm pretty sure there is a lot of that different or difficulty to, to do a business with the Chinese. And based from your experience, like, what can uh, Chinese? improve, because you say a lot of good, good stuff about Chinese, I want to hear some business of Chinese. What can Chinese improve to, um, to do better business with around the world, people around the world? You know, the, the, the major weakness China has is it doesn't have enough people with um, deep experience of international business. And the only way you get that is by being involved in international business. There's no shortcut. And it will take 20 to 30 years to develop the skills. And you're part of it. You're learning abroad, you work abroad, you study abroad, you get to know a great deal, and you teach your children. Excuse me, eating a mint as I'm talking. Very inappropriate. Um, that, um, if I go back to 15 years ago, I could name the only 10 people in China who could work outside China about 15 years ago. Uh, today there are hundreds, if not thousands of Chinese. And there are more and more Chinese. You know, when the, Jap the Chinese have spent a lot of time studying what the Japanese did wrong, but they got the Plaza Accord wrong, they revalued their currency too easily. But what they also did was they didn't allow their, they didn't bring their law firms, their accounting firms, their banks abroad with their firms as they went global. You see Chinese accounting firms and Chinese law firms are coming into London. And so you see a great deal of well-thought-out development. You see a lot of testing going on, and then you see the rolling out of policies. So I don't think that I would say that there's anything I would do differently. Um, I don't think there's anything I would do differently. Um, I would just understand that China is in a process of developing into a global trading power. You know, you've seen ICBC just bought 60% of standards trading operations in London. Uh, and that's a very major move. And they'll have a lot of problems. They'll, they'll get some corruption problems, some risk problems, and that kind of stuff. But the Chinese government, no, unless they do this and put people in, in, the, in, the, in front of the fire, they won't learn uh, the lessons that have to be learned because you can only learn them by doing them. And as, as, as people learn and understand the the problems and the risks, 
So they'll broaden the number of people that are exposed to that situation and, and broaden it. So I don't think China should rush the process of internationalization, of globalization. Uh, but I think that they've been at it now for 15, 20 years. It's only now it's being seen by the rest of the world because it's impacting businesses everywhere. You know, you go to Africa, uh, the planes are a third full of Chinese business people. And uh, you go back 10 years, they, they weren't on the planes. So the impact of China around the world is, is much more significant in the developing world than it is in the developed world. And um, losing. If we, are we getting towards the end? <coughs> I think I would say this. That the big business, if you take the big British businesses, RTZ, GSK, all these big businesses that are on the FTSE 100, they have to consider how to have business relationships with major Chinese global companies, and the Chinese have to consider how to have major business relationships with those companies. So, for example, you've seen that Tesco's had a whole lot of stores in China. Um, China Resources formed a joint company with them. Tesco's have got 28% of um, that joint venture based in uh, Hong Kong, but with stores in China. Why would China Resources just not let them close them down? Why did China Resources take a, a joint company giving Tesco's 28%? I think because they want Tesco's. You know, you ask yourself this question. What is the ultimate expression of going up the value chain? It's owning the retail. And I think that uh, that's how far forward thinking China is. I think you'll begin to see China buying retailers and develop and owning retail operations in the West, if the West allows them to do it. Um, and in Britain, they probably would be allowed to do it. In America, they might be stopped, or Germany. So I think you're going to see um, uh, a great deal of what is being planned, you'll see happening in 10 or 15 years' time. I think the depth of that planning and analysis in the party is phenomenal. And you know, just in lastly, when you meet these guys, coming back to the question from that uh, lady in the, the young lady in the middle there, um, I've met senior officials of leading groups from the party, and they're wearing the oldest suits and they haven't got their hair cut styled at all. They are very, um, very serious people. They get on with their jobs. and they, they're, um, they're very modest, but they're very, very skilled. In 1997, I met the leading group on the economy, and they, and they, we had a discussion that was clear to me that they were going to make major cuts in the state-owned enterprises, that they were going to put them on stock exchanges. This was in 1997. The first moves didn't happen until 2002. The first rotations, I think, were 2005. They'd already worked it out in 1997 when I met them. They probably worked it out five years before. So there's a lot of forward planning going on in China. It's um, impressive. So it's a good idea for people... Here to go back to China and work for China. <laughs> uh, you're Chinese, you know, you, you'll, find, you'll find your own missions. Um, I think it's very interesting for you to work outside China because that's what you are, you're internationalists, that's why you're here. Because you want the international exposure, you want the international contact. Uh, some of you will feel you want to live in China and raise your children in China. For none of you right now would the issue of your children be uh, in your minds. But I lived and worked in America, and when I decided to have children, I moved back to London because I wanted my children to speak to me in an English accent. And not <laughs> <laughs> so you may, you, you know, your, your international feeling may be deep now, and some of you may feel you want to be back in China when you have a family. It's part of the joys of living, you know. It's uh, the choices are out there, but you've got them. A lot of people don't have them. Enjoy them. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Uh, can we have a last round of applause for him? Thank you.